<coughs> okay. So what we are going to do today is you no know, pass pass back to them during the test or whatever thing or when you next see them. Okay. I don't know next semester or what. Okay, so what we are going to do today is on your Thai square test and your Fisher exact test. Okay, so when do you use Thai square test? When do you use Thai square test? When do, when do you use it? Under what situation? Yep, when do you use your Thai square test? Yep. No, when, when? Under what situation? Yep. Okay. So basically what you're trying to do is to find to find out whether the expected or rather the observed observed distribution. Basically, this is your data follows the expected distribution. Okay, so that is the main thing that you use chi-square for. Okay, so the observed expected distribution can be any distribution. In fact, you can use chi-square to, if your data size is large enough, you can use chi-square to check whether is the data normally distributed or not. It has to be large enough. Okay, so this idea of observed distribution and expected distribution, you are looking at Technically, is the shape of the histogram similar? Okay, you are looking at whether the two shape of the histogram is close enough. So the now hypothesis in this case is that the um, observed distribution is equals to or similar to your expected distribution. Okay, your alternate hypothesis is the observed distribution is not equals to the expected distribution. That is the general concept of it. Okay, so how do you use this? Do you think you use this often, and, uh, often in your work? Actually, very often. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, um, how many of you still remember your Mendelian genetics? Huh? What, huh? Six, uh, one. Yeah, of course, uh, science one. Uh. Then what? Oh, yeah, partner square, your Mendelian genetics. So Mendelian genetics, you have your monohybrid cross and the hybrid cross. So anybody still remember the hybrid cross? So, for example, your dihybrid cross, you have um, the, the two alleles. So, allele one, you have your smooth, smooth skin versus your wrinkled, wrinkled skin. Your allele two can be your green versus yellow. Okay. So, in this case, assuming that your smooth and green skin, uh, smooth and green, uh, smooth and green skin. This is your uh, dominant trait. So this yellow or wrinkled is your recessive. Okay. Anybody still remember the ratio, the phenotype ratio that you get? Huh? What? 9331, correct. So the is actually 9331. 
Okay. So that is, so assuming that you count 1,600 piece. Okay. So you can actually draw your statistic. Okay. So this is your phenotype. What is phenotype? Okay. And your expected versus observed. So let's say our phenotype is smooth and green. You have your smooth and yellow. You have your wrinkled and green. Wrinkled and yellow okay so based on this which one is the nine which one is three three one nine is recessive huh? <laughs> you want me to call Do you want me to call dr Lee to give you a smack <laughs> No, I was just send this video to Dr. Lake and send ask her to listen to whoever that is. Okay, anyway. So this is a Mendelian genetics. This is a 9331. Okay. So when you actually count 1600 piece, what is the expected based on the ratio itself? If you count 1,600 piece, what is the expected number of smooth and green? 900. 900, 300, 300, and 100. But let's say when you actually do the P counting, do you think that you get exactly 900, 300, 300, 100? No, no right? So you will get something that looks like this. Maybe you get nine, uh, you get Okay, you get 880, so this is 320, then here you get 320, this you get 80, for example. So, based on this, does the ratio still hold? Okay, your question becomes, does the ratio still hold? So indirectly, what you are doing is this. You have your observed and the expected. What you are looking at is compare these two and say whether the observed deviates substantially from the expected. Okay. So indirectly, your now hypothesis is that the proportion of your observed is equal to the proportion of your expected. Alternate hypothesis means that the proportion is observed is not equal equals to the proportion of your expected. Then it could be another uh, Mendelian ratio. Okay. Have you studied your ep uh, epistat epistatic interactions? That means instead of 933, one will be 934 for this thing. Okay. All right. So this is what we are trying to do in your chi-square test. Another part is if you have done your tutorial questions already, which some of you did, some of you haven't, your chi square, how do you calculate your chi square statistic? Um, your observed minus expected square divided by expected. Okay, that's why it's called chi square, because your numerator is square. And the degrees of freedom, what is it? It's not n minus one, that's the problem. 
is the number of categories minus one. Okay, so this is actually quite important. In fact, we will come to that. Why is it so important? So let's do a chi square test first. Okay. Chi square test is not in your data analysis step. You have to do it yourself. Done? Okay, done? Okay, so <clears throat> let's look at here. Let's do a first question. Your first question asks you, let's say a survey of 100 people and find that 20 of them like chocolate cakes, 35 like strawberry cakes, 16 like blueberry cakes, 12 like cheesecake, and 8 like carrot cakes. Is there enough evidence to reject the claim that there's equal preference? So let's take this whole thing and see how we do it. So what we know here is that 20 likes chocolate cakes. Okay. 35 likes strawberry. In likes blueberry. Twenty one likes cheesecake. And eight likes carrot cakes. Okay. So what is our hypothesis here? What is our now hypothesis? Oh, you pay seven single. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, so what is the now hypothesis here? No. <laughs> what is that? What is the expected? No. The expected is this equal preference. Okay, the expected is the now hypothesis is that there is equal preference for the type of cakes. Okay, the alternate hypothesis is that there's unequal preference. It is now an alter hypothesis essentially. Okay, so make sure you state the hypothesis correct in the first place. <clears throat> All right. So then what we have is we have two columns, your expected and observed. Okay, then let's put the categories. You have chocolate cake, berry, berry. Is and carrot. Okay, so all these numbers, the, the numbers that you do for get from a survey, is it under the observed category or the expected category? Or observed or expected? Observed. observed, because that's your data. So the data is observed. So you put in 20, 35, 16, 12, 21, and 8. Then what should you put for expected? If, correct. So if it's equal, which what should you put for every or twenty? Correct. Because it's equal, so you expect twenty for each one. Okay. So there are two ways of doing it. Let's do the way that you do in your tutorial first. So in your tutorial, what you need is to have another column. You take the observed minus expected, square it, divide by expected. 
Okay, so you put in your formula itself. Observe minus expected. Error. Divide by expected. If you do it correctly, this will be your values. All right. Okay. So then your chi square statistic. The chi square statistic is essentially the summation of all this. So you sum up together. The chi square statistic is 19.3. Sum of this. Okay. And what is the degree of freedom here? Four. Four. Right. Five minus one. Okay. Remember your chi square statistic. Chi square test. Your degrees of freedom is number of categories minus one. Okay. Very important. And what you need, the next one is your critical value. Okay, so to find a critical value, or rather, um, you take the significance first. The significance you want is 0 0.05. Okay, 5% 5 significance. Then you have your critical value. Okay. So critical value, we already covered this in the first two lessons. You have to take the area and find out what is the axis, the value on the axis. So for this, you use the chi-square inverse distribution. Chi-square inverse, and you want the right tail. The probability that you want, the area under the curve that you want is 5%. Degrees of freedom is 4. Okay. So that gives you the critical value. So a critical value is about 9.5. What? Oh, because you have one is right tail, one is actually two tails. Okay, so based on this, do you accept or reject now hypothesis? No, you have a critical value and a statistic. So do you accept or reject now hypothesis? Reject. Okay, right, because since your yes. Chi square is only right there. Chi huh? square statistic is more than the critical value. You reject your now hypothesis. And you accept the alternate hypothesis. And what does the alternate hypothesis mean? So there is unequal preference. Or type of kicks. Okay. So that is the conclusion essentially. Okay, so this is exactly what you did in your uh, tutorial. Okay. Now, if you want to do the Excel version or R version, Another way is to look directly at the p-value, correct? So if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, then you reject now hypothesis. Okay. So how do you get the p-value directly? Okay. So this is even an easier function. You just go to chi-square test itself. Chi-square dot test. Okay, you have two, two variables to put in, actual range and expected range. Actual range is essentially observed range. So you highlight the observed. 
then expected is the expected. Close the bracket. Okay, so this is your p value. Do you accept or reject now hypothesis? Yeah. Also reject, right? Because p value is less than 5%. So you can write since p value is less than 0 0.05, you reject your now hypothesis. And the conclusion remains the same. So this is another way of doing it. <clears throat> okay, so what does this mean? What does the p-value and the chi-square statistic mean? So it really means this thing, huh? that if you have your chi-square distribution. The chi-square distribution looks something like that. Okay. And your statistic here is 19.3. So this is 19.3. The area under the curve is um, 0 0.000686. So this is 0 0.00. 0686. That is what it means. Okay. You can actually take these numbers and calculate the p value as well. So you can calculate the p value to check. Okay, so you have to use the chi square inverse. I don't know, you use the chi square distribution, right tail distribution. The x value is your chi square statistic. Degrees of freedom is a degrees of freedom for, and that gives you the same answer as the p value. Okay, so it's actually the same thing. So that's that's essentially how you go from this number to this number. Yes. So, which means that if you have enough data, remember your normal distribution, you can actually break up into different bins. You can actually check is your data normally distributed based on that, but your data has to be large enough. That means there are thousands of data points before you can do that. So, you can go from things like uh, from 0 standard deviation to 0 0.5 standard deviation, from 0 0.5 to 1 standard deviation. How many percentage of the items are there? You can actually do that. It's not, it's nothing wrong. All right. So actually that is high square test. It's very simple. Nothing very complicated about it. This is the simplest part of high square test. Okay. The next part before we, when we go on is looking at contingency tables. Feature asset, we cover feature asset test later. Okay. So what does contingency table do? Contingency table, you are, you are taking whether is the expect is the observed contingency table. Okay, so let me just so for contingency table. What you are doing is is the observed. contingency table matching your expected contingency table. That's what it's trying to that's what it's trying to do. Okay. Okay, then in the lecture itself and in the tutorial question or whatever, you keep seeing these two different things. Test for independence and goodness of fit. Now, based on the name, test of independence and test of goodness of fit, does it seem opposite of each other? 
you are saying that two variables, independence means the two variables doesn't relate to each other. And goodness of fit, you are talking about two variables to be as close together as each other. Okay. So they are, they are conceptually different. The good thing is the calculation is identical. The calculation is identical. Okay. So what you have is here, you have your, let's say we do your observed contingency table. So observed contingency table, you look something like this. Okay. So this is your exposure. So exposure, positive, negative, outcome, also positive and negative. Okay. So this is your standard two by two contingency table. So you have four values here. We call this A, B, C, and D. Then you have also the expected contingency table. The expected contingency table will look identical. This is your exposure. Plus minus and the outcome. Okay. We call this A, B, C and D. So how do you get the two contingency table into this format that you can calculate. You have to join them together. Basically break apart. Okay, how do you actually break apart? Essentially what you do is you use a template. So this template is just a hypothetical idea. You have your expected observe, uh, expect exposure, exposure, plus, minus, and the outcome. So this is case one, case two, case three, and case four. Okay. So what you really do is this. You map these two up into here and produce your table. So your table essentially will look like this. So this is the case, case one, case two, case three, and case four. Okay. Just erase this to need. Okay. Then here will be your Expected. So expected, this is A, B, C, and D. Your observed, this is A, B, C, and D. Just map the numbers accordingly. And from there, you can calculate your chi square. So from here, you can calculate your chi square statistic. The only problem is what is your degrees of freedom here? Huh? It's not three. It's not three. When you're doing contingency table, it is so ends up with one. Because is here is the number of rows and number of columns. Okay, so based on this idea, two by two contingency table is the least you can do, because otherwise you get degrees of freedom equals to zero. Okay, let's say if it's a three by three contingency table, what is the degrees of freedom? Three by three. 
four, correct? Yeah, just minus one row and minus one column. Anyone did A levels here before? No, right? <laughs> okay. Anyway, because um, this taking one row and one column off, there's actually a name for it. Okay. So with this, you can actually do any kind of contingency table. Just make sure your degrees of freedom is correct. Okay, that's all. And if you, and this is the reason why you have to calculate the p value here yourself, because if you go through the original method, the simplified method, right, you will take the degrees of freedom equals to three. Your number of columns, my uh, number of categories minus one. You have to calculate this yourself. Okay, that's important here. Okay, so any problem as far as this part is concerned? Okay, so with that, let's us go to our favorite R now. Now, nobody in the right frame of mind will do a normal chi square test with R. Just because Excel can do it very easily. Because it's in your lab. Okay. Okay, so anyway. Okay, so look at this. <clears throat> what you are doing here is, let's say you are going to test the number of smokers. They consider example that you interviewed 20 people, uh, 200 people, and seven of them smoke regularly. Your hypothesis is that 5% of Singaporeans smokes regularly. Okay, so let's do in Excel first, what will be the map, what, how will you do it? What is the now hypothesis? No, but what is the? <laughs> so yeah, it's 5% smokers. 5% are smokers. Okay. Alternate hypothesis? Just not 5% smokers? Huh? Okay. So based on your data, you have your expected and your observed. So what will be the categories now? Remember, you need minimum two categories. So what are the two categories that you can give? Smokers and non-smokers. Yeah, no? smokers, non -smokers. smokers and non-smoker. Okay. So your observed is actually given based on your survey. Seven of them smokes regularly. So how many of them smokes non-regularly or not smoking? Or 93. Okay. Expected. If 5% are smokers, what is your expected? 10. Because total is 20. Non-smoker? 190. Okay. So here you can calculate the p-value directly. Use your chi-square test. Joe. And your expected. In this case, can you do you accept or reject the null hypothesis? Accept. Accept. So since your p value is less than 0 0.05, you fail to reject your null hypothesis. Then Essentially, that's that's a conclusion. Five percent smokers. Now, if it rejects your now hypothesis, it only tells you that that's not equal to five percent smokers. It doesn't tell you that it's four percent or six percent. Nothing else. You go and do an individual test yourself. 
So how do we do it in R? Let's look at the code itself. Huh? What? Okay, just put it in yourself. So the first variable, you give it the actual count data. 7 and 193. So the C is a C bind. Basically, you group the thing together. P means the probability. So you don't have to give the expected range. You give the probability based on the expected range. Okay, so it's 5%, 95%. And the numbers, the count is actually calculated based on the total numbers. Okay, so you have a change to correction, no correction. So that's all for your chi square test. And you get the p value as well. Okay, and your chi square is also given there. All right, that's all for R. Okay. But R can allow you to do your uh, contingency table quite easily. So contingency table first, let's say we want to look at this. Test for independence is opposite way. You want to look at smoking status versus uh, infant weight. So this is uh, early part of our lecture already. Does smoking and infant weight, is it correlated to each other? Is there a relationship or is there an independence of it? So what you do is you construct the contingency table first. Now you put in all the four numbers into a C bind function. This, this C. Okay. Then you split into two rows. So the numbers have to be even numbers. So let's put it here first. Yeah, you centric, do this. Okay. So these four numbers is asking Excel, uh, asking R to take these four numbers and split into two rows. So it's two by two. Okay. You run it, should not give you a problem. Okay, the next step is to do a chi square on this contingency table. So you do a chi square test on this contingency table and you don't correct. Correction equals to false. So this is your result. So what does it mean? Are the is smoking status affected, or is the uh, infant weight affected by smoking status? Yes. Okay. Because a p value more than zero point zero five means that the infant weight is not affected by smoking status. the two variables are independent of each other. Yeah. So if the two variables are not independent of each other, means that there's a relationship. Okay, so any problem with this for now? That is essentially how you do a contingency table in R, nothing very much. So from R, uh, from chi square, when do you use Fisher exact test?
So when do you use Fisher exact test again? Not nice. No, since when DF is more than five. <clears throat> so if you look at the criteria, when do you use your Fisher exact test? When degrees of freedom equals to one and expected frequency above 10. Okay. Or when it's higher. So it mean, generally means that you use your Fisher as a test for small data science. So in order to do chi square test, these two must be fulfilled. If degrees of freedom is one, expected frequency must be above 10. If degrees of freedom is greater than one, that means more than three, more than two categories, three or more, expected frequency, all of them must be above five to use chi square. So which means that you reverse feature exact test is for small sample size. Now, will you use Fisher exact test often? No, please don't ever do that. Because sometimes you need it. Sample size is too small. Fisher exact test is for small sample size. If a sample size is so small, look at this. If the smoking status and whether the child infant weight you are looking at just how many numbers? Three, seven of them for smoking, and 12 of them for non-smoking. So the samples are small. And we go even lower than that, which means that if this is statistically significant, you are basing all your study on just three babies, three to four babies, essentially. What do you mean? How do you do Fisher? Oh, so in order to do again. If degrees of freedom is one, is all the frequency above ten? Then can use chi square independence. Read the sentence before that. What is your logic? Read the sentence before that. If this will if this requirement is not met for chi square test, then you use Fisher exact test. Okay. You, you, it's not common because the sample size is too small. So why, if you actually have to go to a point where you need to use feature exact test, unless there are exceptional cases that you cannot get more sample size, I'll just ask you to do more experiment or collect more data. Yes, then no choice, you have to do this. Okay. Sometimes it's very difficult to get these numbers, then no choice. Yes, yeah. Okay. So what we have is, similarly, we built a matrix. So three, four, three, nine, we actually built. So anybody can tell me what this command is actually doing? Making a contingency, a two by two contingency table. So three, four, three, nine. As the table. Okay. Then if you just print out the contingency table, you get this number, this type of labels. You actually do not know what's the row and column. So the next step is actually not really needed. Here is to just put in the table uh, headers. So this is just to put in the labels. The labels for smoking, non-smoking, less than 2.5 kg or more than 2.5 kg. Then if you print out contingency table again, 
This is what you get. So you make, just keep basically writing in the labels. Nothing much. After that, you do your chi-square test. You do your chi-square test using your contingency table and the corrected equals to false. So this is the one that gives you your p-value. Approximation, yeah. The approximation, because the sample size is too low, so approximation may not be right. Thank you. You accept now hypothesis. Okay, but I said now hypothesis based on the sample size. Okay, so if you think about it, if you look, if you, you reverse back, right? Yeah. I just changed the number a little bit. So smoking, um, smoking and non-smoking. If I do a four and four, that means I have one more baby. You realize that p-value changes a lot just by adding one more baby in. Okay, from the small weight smokers, just add one more baby. Yeah, the, the sample size is too small. So every addition of one baby to whichever numbers affects it a lot. This is why, uh, unless you have a specific reason, go and collect more data. Okay, that's all. Nothing very much. Okay. Enough for you to do a chi square test, which means that every one, every cell needs to be more than 10. At least. The more, the better. Later, we'll see the more, the better. Okay. And you can actually use this. So what is the approximation? Uh, what is the expected? Now is this actual, right? What is expected? Okay. You can actually calculate the expected. So this is the expected numbers. In chi square or in Fisher exact test, the expected can have a decimal place but your observe cannot have a decimal place. Because the observe is a count. The expected can be a ratio, visualized. So it can have a decimal place. Okay. Yes, correct. So this is one mistake. Huh? Don't, don't assume that the expected can not have a decimal place, expected can have a decimal place. A lot of people make this mistake. Yeah, a lot of people make this mistake. Okay, my own lecturer in Bali made this mistake. Yeah, I went to Bali, of course. Okay. All right, the next thing that we are going to do is this simple, this question, which is actually your tutorial question one. Okay. This is a, um, okay. Can you use percentage instead of counts or this we call it a frequency for your chi square test can you use percentage instead yeah. cannot never never use percentage this is the second error that most people will make you cannot use percentage you always have to use count i'll show you later
Okay. So let us do a example in this. Okay. Let us just do a now hypothesis that we have fifth. Um, so fifty percent of the people likes coffee. 50% likes tea, so only two, two beverage. 50% like coffee, 50% like tea, very simple, right? However, the actual data that you collect is that you have 51% likes coffee. How many percent likes tea? 49% likes tea. Okay, so then let's look at different cases. Let's say you have case number one. Case number one, you use you use percentage. When you use percentage, automatically what is the hypothetical n value sample size? So it's hundred, right? If you look at chi square test, the statistic for calculate chi square test is summation of observed minus expected divided by expected. Okay. Degrees of freedom just now you mentioned is number of categories minus one. Now, if you look at the equation itself, what is actually missing? What is actually missing in the whole equation that is always found in your ANOVA, found in t-test and everything else? What is that one variable that's missing? That one symbol that's missing? No, not significance. What is that one symbol that is missing that you see in your t test, your ANOVA, but it's actually. Huh? What? What symbol is missing? From where? From chi square test that you see in your t test and ANOVA. And it's actually a very important number. It's a value. What, what is actually missing here? Number of samples, correct. Because in, in your t-test and your ANOVA, your degrees of freedom is actually sample size minus one in general case. So this is totally missing here. Num this number of categories is not number of sample size. Okay. So now, how many of you also realize that or feel that chi square test, the equation is ridiculously easy compared with your ANOVA and t-test? Chi square test is very easy, right? In terms of calculation wise. Okay. Now, this is chi square test is developed by this guy called Carl Pearson. That's where you get your Pearson's correlation from. Okay, you don't have to already know him. Okay. ANOVA and T-test is actually affected by this guy called, the person who comes up with ANOVA is your Ronald Fisher. That's where you get your Fisher exact test, F-test and everything. Anything that you see ANOVA, Fisher or F is troublesome to calculate. That's why your Fisher exact test is very tedious to calculate. Anything, every time in statistics you see Fisher, F, or ANOVA, the equations are very long or tedious to calculate. Anything that you see Pearson is easy to calculate. No, but it doesn't matter which one comes first. 
your ANOVA, if, remember inside your um, t-test, your uh, what? Your variance you put wrongly, you get everything wrong already. But ANOVA, the uh, Pearson's correlation doesn't do that. It's actually easier. So these two people, as as you go along learning statistics, these two people are enemies of each other. So the way that they think is also very different. Yeah, that that enemies until they die. Okay. Okay. So they are the people. They are, you, you can go and read about their history. They fight with each other a lot. Fight with everything, and they actually in conferences in the in the early 1900s they will punch each other. Yeah, they punch each other in conferences and throw books at each other kind of people. Okay. Yeah. Because they literally hate each other. No, they, they are, their philosophy don't come in the, together. So that's why when you look at statistics, you realize that somehow they don't match. Certain things doesn't gel together. It's because of the original history. No, up to today. Okay. Both of them died already. Okay. However, as I mentioned, in your chi square test sample size and seems missing however it's actually inside the equation just that you never see it at all yes this is the reason why because it is actually not ex explicit in the equation you can not use proportion. Proportion cannot use percentage or anything like that. You have to use count because the sample size n is there. Cannot also. Okay. So let's look at this problem first. If we take percentage, we are taking hundred. So we have your expected. And observed. P and T. Okay, what is if equal proportion, what is your expected? 50, 50, right? So 50, 50. Observed. So coffee will be 51, 49. Okay. And let's calculate your p-value first. Do your chi square test to get the p-value. Actual range and expected range. Do you accept or reject now hypothesis? Accept, right? Because the p-value is more than 0 0.05. So you accept now, hypothesis. <clears throat> okay, then let's say another group of you will be pretty energetic and you actually, group two, you sample more people, survey more people. Let's say you survey 1,000 people. 10 times more. So what will be the expected? You survey 1,000 people. 500, 500, right? Okay. Because it's equal, so 500, 500. How about the observed? If 51 actually likes coffee, what is the expected here? 510, 510, 490, right? Look at the p-value actually changes. The p-value is not the same, but you still, Except now hypothesis. See what happens if we do the, if you have another group of students who are super good, case three, let's say you survey all the people in this poly, 10,000 people. 
What is the expected now? 5,000. 5,000. Observed? Yes, correct. Because 51%. So it's 5100, 4900. Now you accept or reject now hypothesis? Correct. This is the reason why you cannot use percentage. If you use percentage, it doesn't matter what is the sample size, you go back to case number one. What? What no percentage? Case number two and case number three is no percentage? Huh? Yes, you can. Yeah. No. Percentage means that no matter what numbers you have, you convert them into percentages. That means you survey 1,000 people, 10,000 people, you convert the numbers to percentage of expected and observed. Okay. All right. So this is the important part because you always do a mistake here. Okay. All right. Now. Okay. Any problem up to here? Then that's all for today. Oh, you. Okay, that's all. Huh? Go, and, go and pass to whoever people. What? Okay.